Hey guys, it's Dr. Sage. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you are new and just joining me, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and I am truly passionate about helping people heal their relationships, both in childhood and adulthood, from really all of the reasons and sources that cause these issues. So we are right now in the midst of a series on healing attachment disturbances and wounds, and we're just having some coffee together today and diving into how to heal your avoidant attachment style. There are going to be 14 steps I'm going to discuss in this video, and the next few videos will explore anxious and then disorganized styles. We're going to look at back to some body work understanding, and then I'm going to share with you a protocol that I think is a very powerful one to be using and then we'll kind of stop this series the daily posting because it's just a lot but i just wanted to get you guys up to speed really fast and then i'll continue to post probably twice a week after this next week after this week but i'm so glad you're here if you're new please consider subscribing and clicking the bell and that way you'll get notified when i post new videos and just one more little thing, which is I do post once to maybe three times a day on TikTok, everything pretty much related to these same topics on my channel. So please feel free to also follow me there. Okay, so if you're just tuning in, I've been talking about in the last several videos, the relationship between attachment and polyvagal theory and how our our, really our attachment story lives inside our body in our nervous system and how from the moment we're born our nervous systems are responding to whatever environment we found ourselves in. Was it a very anxious activated environment like an anxious attachment? Was it a more you know controlled, less emotional, more rigid environment like an avoidant? Was it a mix in disorganized? Or were you in a generally healthy dynamic, but now you've found yourself with a partner with a different style than you and you're trying to understand them, right? So all of those can play out in different ways and your knowledge here, I hope, will help you no matter what relationship you're in. But today's video is really about avoidant attachment. And just to quickly summarize, avoidant attachment historically is about repeated maternal rejection. That's what the research says. Of course, the, the research, as I keep saying, was done on moms, but anyone can be a primary attachment figure. But what basically happened was the child's bids and attempts for attachment, their sort of needs, were often shut down and dismissed, especially their negative emotions like anger or crying, neediness, and things like that. And so the child, Sorry, so the child interprets that as rejection and learns to deactivate their needs. And they become little autonomous human beings and adults. We're often very pseudo-independent, very self-reliant, always kind of lean into our self-reliance first and foremost. We feel safest, often threatened by real intimacy and vulnerability because it's scary. Although deep down, many people will say that they long for connection, but they just find themselves in many ways sort of sabotaging connection in ways that they can't really help or control. And so today's video is going to talk about that. All right, so that's the summary. Now let's go into what you need to work on healing if you have a more avoided attachment style. There are 14 points, as I said, I'm going to get to. Number one. Because when you were emotionally needy, your needs were often dismissed or rejected, you tend to shut down your needs yourself. Whenever you feel longings for connection or an activation of your needs, you tend to even, you know, maybe dissociate from them, numb them by substances, by shutting down, by you know, intellectualizing in your head and, and trying to walk yourself through it so that you don't have to feel those uncomfortable feelings, but they're still there. And so the first step is to begin to work on acknowledging that you have needs, that it's okay to be needy, to long for connection, that feelings aren't necessarily a bad thing. And so you want to work on learning how to identify and sort of connect to your emotions and thoughts and feelings and needs, not only with yourself, but with others in your life. 
And that's a whole other video series on identifying emotion I will get to at some point, but that's the first one. Number two is that many avoidant type parents were not comfortable with physical affection, with expressing it, hugging, touching, that, those kinds of things. And so I will say that many of those who are avoidant, while they can be a little more touchy in the beginning and are often able to separate actual intimacy in a very, you know, you know what I mean kind of way, but they're not so good with just like, you know, caressing your back or your hair or, or letting themselves be touched that way. They have a hard time sometimes with that kind of engagement. And so you really want to work on identifying your, do you have physical needs? And not only, you know, what, what do those feel like? Like when I was talking about polyvagal theory, when you think about someone hugging you or holding your hand or you doing that, does that activate your nervous system in that sort of sympathetic way where you kind of feel anxious or stressed? And so you wanna work on doing things like connecting to your physical needs and working on, you know, maybe just going slowly with your partner, like maybe touching pinky to pinky or hand to hand and then working your way up to holding hands or to cuddling. Many avoidant partners feel like they will do the cuddling thing after intimacy, but they're kind of just putting their time in. It doesn't feel so comfortable. So you want to work on not only acknowledging it, but providing it with a safe partner. And you might share this issue. You know, I, I want to be close, but physical touch is kind of scary. How can we go slowly and work on increasing that, especially when I'm intimate or vulnerable, like when I'm crying or when we're being close? Number three is that because of your childhood, you expect that your negative emotions like crying and anger are going to be rejected, that they are not going to be okay. And so you have to work on first allowing yourself to have them, as I've said. And here is where I would go into inner child work. I've been posting some videos on TikTok, just little affirmations, but you can Google these and I will obviously hopefully come back to more. But this idea of honoring your inner child's feelings, all of them, whether they're, you know, feelings of anger or sadness or fear or jealousy, whatever they are. And also here, I would encourage you to do some self-compassion work. Kristen Neff's website, selfcompassion.org, has great exercises, but learning how to talk to yourself like a loving human and parent saying like, you know, it's okay that you feel sad or scared, or it's okay that you're angry. Learning how to internalize that self through inner child work and self-compassion can be really helpful. Number four, that leads into reparenting. I'm gonna do a whole course on reparenting. In fact, I'm about 75% done with it. But this is the idea of learning how to internalize and repair some mothering or fathering or parenting wounds, and then how to begin to lovingly give yourself that type of support and connection and healing as a new parent to yourself and rewiring those messages and feelings. So reparenting work can be really helpful. The next one is number five, because your parents were often rigid and controlling and often strict or very judgmental, you might also be rigid, strict, judgmental, not only of yourself, but of others. So looking at where do I do that? You know, because oftentimes your needs for empathy and emotion were shut down. And so you might need to do some work on developing compassion, watching other people's stories, catching yourself when you're being judgmental and trying to remember that everyone is a jerk for a reason if they're being a jerk and that you really don't know someone's story. You really don't. You never know what people are going through. I can promise you, even in stories where every box is checked on the outside and life looks perfect, it is not. And so doing some work on your own judgment is important. Number six is that you weren't encouraged to be your unique self. That's part of the childhood challenge. And so really, what, what is it about you that makes you unique? And this is a whole other thing I've included in the, in the series I'm doing on healing of the parenting and reparenting, and it's also in my upcoming course. But how do you identify who you are, what you love, what makes you you? And then working on developing those parts of yourself that you may have shut down because they weren't acceptable. So like, you know, did you really like hippie kind of stuff, but it was, you know, you lived in a very sort of cut and dried preppy household. And so do you want to, you know, check what that means out in terms of your style or your fashion or are you interested in certain kinds of music or art or sports, whatever it is, 
working on developing not only like how you see yourself, but pursuing things that maybe are outside the box that you thought were acceptable in childhood. Number seven is, as I kind of said before, it really is that combination of judging others, but also for being their unique selves. And so looking at where maybe you have some jealousy or resentment towards others because they're able to be their unique selves, but you were never really able to. And then looking at, well, what parts am I jealous of? Because oftentimes resentment or jealousy has information to lead us to parts of ourselves that we feel or are disconnected from. And so that kind of unique self judgment and judging others and their unique selves, looking at what that looks like for you. Number eight is really about honoring your self-reliance and actually making a gratitude list for all of the things that this part of you, this independence, this autonomy has helped you survive and allowing it to be one of your strengths. I know most of this video is going into what you can work on and change, but I really do think it is a profoundly important thing to say you know what, I needed this to survive my childhood and it helped me. And there are some very positive upsides to having parts of yourself be avoidant because the truth is that need to be autonomous and independent often helps us take care of ourselves, survive, you know, push ourselves in the world in ways that other people might not quite yet have the capacity to do. So honor that your self-reliance is a superpower. It's just that you don't want to always have it be your go-to. And so it's about honoring it and loving yourself for it. And like I said, maybe making a gratitude list about all of the things that kind of went into this part of you, how you can be non-emotional sometimes in a crisis, right? Or be the person in the room who is in control. It's just that what you want to do on the flip side is honor that even though you have this and it is basically a superpower, you don't want to use it all of the time. There are times when it is important to ask others for help and there's nothing wrong with not always being self-reliant. So learning how to tap into, do I need to be kind of autonomous here? Or, you know what, I really don't. And it could serve me to let someone else in right now. Can I ask for help? Do I wanna ask for help? I can ask for help. And so you kind of want to learn to wield and honor your self-reliance, but try to balance it a bit more with when you need to not be self-reliant so much and when you want to reach out to others and ask for help. Number nine is that at the core, you often feel that relationships are draining and that you cannot trust others and that's safer to go alone. And so you want to work on doing healing work around understanding that there are ways to be engaged in healthy and safe relationships and that challenging yourself whenever you go to that idea of that, oh, I can't trust anyone. It's like, well, is that really true? Where did that come from? Oh, yeah, that's my childhood. And even if it's a pet you have a safe relationship with, pets can actually be a very good place to start, especially if you are very avoidant. Now, are you drained by your pet? I mean, yeah, taking care of pets can be exhausting, especially if you're depressed, for example. But there is something about that reciprocity and that love that feels so good that isn't draining, you know, most of the time. And that template can be applied to adult relationships. Yes, I know adults and humans are a hundred thousand times more complicated, but you want to look at this idea of being alone. And that ties into number 10, which is, being alone is usually an issue for you because that is often how you regulate it in childhood, removing yourself, going into that sort of dreamy self-auto-regulation stage to deal with all your feelings. And so, for example, I can be like with my kids and they can be in a needy state and I could have just had some experience where I'm feeling kind of disorganized inside in a state and I really just want to be alone. I'm an only child, I'm an introvert, I regulate alone. But in those moments, it's not appropriate for me to go do that. I need to be present for them. And so what I want to do is like I've talked about in the last video, do some breathing, slow down, try to get face to face, eye to eye and centered. Even thinking about putting my little stress in a container. I've discussed the container exercise 
and I need to make a new one, so I'll probably do that too. But like finding ways to just put it away, put it in a drawer in your mind for now, so that you can stop trying to do that auto-regulation alone thing every time and work on what it feels like to be face-to-face, eye-to-eye, and present with someone else in distress and to tolerate their negative emotions and even the ones it's bringing up in you, but not running away to do so. Number 11 is working on internalizing the shame you have. The, oftentimes there's a shame we have with avoidant where we, we feel bad for our needs. We've learned to shut them down so much that we often carry a toxic shame we've internalized for our neediness. And so you might wanna go back to self-compassion, to exercises on dealing with shame, to reparenting, to begin to un, um, acknowledge to yourself that it is okay to have those needs. There is nothing wrong with you. Number 12 is to learn and work on, as I mentioned yesterday, I'll make a video at the end of this on self-soothing techniques. You can Google polyvagal theory or, you know, calming the vagus nerve if you want to get ahead. You know, doing things like breathing, mindfulness, cardio, exercises, meditations, yoga, guided imagery, which I really love. Even just techniques in the moment, just maybe just you know, gently like pat yourself and love yourself, do this kind of thing where you're just gently caressing your hands, tapping, butterfly tapping back and forth, but working on your self-soothing techniques so that you can then calm yourself and then go back in to engagement, not use those techniques to further isolate. Number 13 is to work on attracting and encouraging healthy relationships and some healthy dependency on others, learning how to ask for help, how to reach out, how to be in relationships that feel reciprocal, and where you can safely share your vulnerabilities, really important. And remember, we don't just wanna like dump everything or never share, we wanna slowly build and earn, as Brene Brown talks about, earn vulnerability with others. And lastly is a technique I'm not gonna share today, but it is a way to internalize and create new parent models. And I'm gonna post that at the end of this week. But it is a very important practice you can use and you wanna kind of cultivate it like a meditation. It's really about healing the parent figures inside. And so I will come back to that. So those are the 14, at least this at this moment, I can really, um, based on the research, share with you. Each one, of course, could be its own video, and as I'm trying to balance, I've got to finish my courses, and so, of course, I did this daily series right when I was trying to finish my courses, and so I'm even spending the rest of today working on my course and other courses I'll be sharing, but I will keep talking about these topics, and once we get through all of this kind of healing stuff, I really want to go into the adult relationship parts and share more videos there, too, Um, always also tying back to childhood, so... I think this video was a little bit longer, but I do think it's an important one, and I hope you found it helpful. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. I love it when you guys share, and it makes me feel when I see little notes like, oh, this made sense, or thank you. I don't need thanks in that way, but, you know, when you're doing this and it's growing and, and it's growing, but growing slowly, you know, you think, okay, am I doing this right? You know, what should I be doing differently? And so it's been quite the journey, but... At the end of the day, you know, I just, I I really believe this stuff can change your life. So thanks for watching. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye guys.